Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Millman. I'm a specialist at the Parent Resource Center, and I want to welcome you to our webinar, our third in a series titled Growing Through Tough Moments. And ladies, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. And we'd like to extend all of you a warm welcome. We'll start with some intros. Uh, I'm Laura Tiemann, and I'm one of the social worker supervisors. And uh, I'm, I have a little congestion, so you'll hear my voice be a little scratchy at times, and I apologize for that. I'm really grateful to be here with Amy and Lori. And I'll, I'll let them introduce themselves, and then uh, I'll, I'll uh, invite us to move forward. Hello, I'm Amy Sheldon. I'm one of the preschool mental health clinicians um, with FCPS. Um, I am within the early childhood assessment team office or child find office, um, and I'm excited to be here with everyone. Good morning again. I'm Lori Creighton, and I'm an educational specialist with Behavior Intervention Services, and we have 28 members on our team and our behavior intervention teachers support each school throughout the county when there are behavioral concerns that are impacting a student's learning. So we are definitely a resource for teachers and for parents. Welcome. And whether you have joined us for the first or second of this series, or this is your first time joining us, we're really happy to welcome you to Growing Through Tough Moments for Early Learners. And if you've had any tough moments, um, like all of us, we're in the right place together. And uh, we know that this is recorded, so we hope that um, you can share it out and refer back to it, that it would be meaningful uh, for you today. So what we'll do is start with a little check-in to see how um, we're doing. And we'll invite you, if you'd like to, to use the chat. Um, so we're gonna look at Frog's feelings today. This is an example of a creative way to identify and express our emotions. And so um, if you can identify with one of these emotions, go ahead and put it in the chat. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and also we can see that Frog is showing us some different signals, right? Um, calm, thank you, Sophie. Wonderful, wow, a lot of, I'll just kind of take that in here, a lot of calm um responses wonderful and this is an example of how when we start with ourselves it really helps us to set the tone and kind of open our minds and hearts uh for unhappy oh thank you uh for the for the work at hand and it's a wonderful way to engage our children especially if perhaps you know just speaking directly to them like how do you feel? You know, it, it's it's nice to kind of look at a visual. Sometimes it just gives a place to join and connect. We'll also look at these visuals at the very end and give you a chance to kind of notice any changes over time, just in our short time together, as we um, as we talk about these some of these really important themes today. So we'll we'll move into our hopes. Our hopes for today. Um, the power of modeling. So one of the tools we sometimes forget that we already have, each of us already have it, is we bring ourselves. And being a role model doesn't mean we have to have everything together. So we can, can breathe a collective sigh of relief. It means that um, we can grow in being fully present in the moment and understand more about the power that we have to um, be present and pause and bring more of our best selves to situations, especially some of those tough moments. So some of those opportunities that modeling offers us in supporting our children. We'll reflect on developmental expectations and what that means in terms of what is really, uh, what we should be expecting of ourselves and our children in different stages and places so that we can know what, um, what is realistic. And when it comes to expectations kind of think of it like if I had a three-year-old and I brought them to a bike outside and I said well Josie I'd like you to get going and, and start riding well if Josie's never had practice on skill building for bike riding well then that's going to be really hard so if we look at it as what are those skills that maybe are the not yet skills they're on their way um opportunities uh we'll 
will leave you on the edge of your seat. Those have to do with oops moments and how they have the power to bring us a lot of um, unexpected joy and opportunity for growth in case we have oops moments, which I definitely have. Um, we all have some of those moments that don't go quite right or kind of go south. Uh, tools and tips for tough moments. So more on strategies and details. And then as we position ourselves towards the summer months, what are some of the uh, resources and uh, ways that you can feel like you have some go-tos for ways to stay connected with us and FCPS and our community. And as you look towards the fall and helping your children to have a successful, both a successful finish to their school year and a successful start, setting them up for some six, um, moments, those transition moments coming up in, in the fall. So those are some of our, our hopes for today. And I will invite you to use the chat just like you have been so far. Um, you got to nourish to flourish. So thank you. Was it Amy, you who found this, this slide? This is so lovely. You got to nourish to flourish. And I want to do a snap after that. I would like to focus a little bit on the power of neighborhood connections. What I realized a couple of years ago, I learned that in the research, if you have two neighbors that you can connect with, that you can count on during times that you feel stressed, that actually that boosts your mental wellness, not only for yourself as a parent or caregiver, but also for your children. So I learned this in a new way during um, the, the lockdown part of the pandemic, that the, the, the porch meetings I had with my neighbor became even more meaningful because we were able to sort of check in with one another, see how we were doing. And what I didn't realize is that that was really nourishing to me as a person and as a mom. And then when I went back home into my house, I was feeling like, all right, okay, I feel a little more supported and able to deal with all the unpredictability that was unfolding and still is unfolding. We have a lot of circumstances that are tough in our experiences in, in, in the world and maybe even our own lives. I know COVID rates are up. And so you just want to take a time to um, honor how things sometimes just feel messy and, and, and overwhelming and the importance of taking time for ourselves um, in what and who is nourishing for us. So that, and I want to invite uh, Lori or Amy, did you want to jump in on this slide? Because I, I think there's just so much here. I would just add, I think a common theme through the, our three presentations and times with you um, is really also about taking care of yourself. Because if you as the parent or caregiver don't take care of yourself, it's going to be really hard to be that caregiver for our children. So it's not selfish. It's not um, you know, taking time away from your child. It's actually allowing yourself to be a better mother, a better father, a better caregiver when you take care of yourself as well. So we give you full permission to please make that time for yourself so that you can also be the best caregiver that you can be for your children. That is so important because it's a myth that, you know, self-care is selfish or a luxury. It's critical for us and to understand that link leads us into the next slide, which is the power of being a role model for our children. And, and, and again, this doesn't mean we have to have it all together because I certainly don't have it all together. And I haven't really met anyone who does as part of being a human person is we all bring our strengths and vulnerabilities. But the power of role modeling is one of the most powerful tools that we have regardless of, um, the ages of our children and ways that we can pass on to them what is most important. And um, just a, a humbling story that I'll share. So um, my children at times have said, well, mom, you know, you tell us to have these technology boundaries, but I don't see you putting down the phone sometimes. And I'm like, oh, so, so that, is that a proud role model moment? No. It's not. However, what I what I did was I said, you are um, you are right. And I'm sorry. And it's something I need to work on. So what that shows is that I'm listening, I'm paying attention. And then also they were right. That's something that I need, needed to work on in terms of making sure I was taking time away from my technology and being present to the needs of the family um, and and understanding that they're watching us and they're looking at us and they're seeing what we're doing. And they pay much more attention to our actions than to our words, right? And um, so it's a, it's a powerful gift 
for our children that we could be authentic with them. And also just thinking of a recent example, when I was feeling kind of overwhelmed and, and I said to, to two of my kids, you know, I'm gonna need more help with this because I'm feeling really tired. And I thought to myself, I should have it all together. And guess what? That's some of that self-talk that's not really too helpful. I thought, well, you know, no one has it all together and we all need help sometimes. And that also, I want my kids, our kids, all of our kids, to grow up knowing when they need to ask for help too and being able to count on it. So being a role model also is being aware of our own limitations and our and things that we need to work on and that's okay. Um, I will um, go ahead and just invite Amy or Lori to, to share here because there's so much, there's so much about this that's connected to self-care and the power of who we are as people on this journey as in parenting. Yeah. I mean, same thing too. I just, I've been working so hard with my son on different ways um, to kind of cool down or deescalate and that kind of thing. And of course, myself got busted when I was a little bit angry and he said, you didn't do any of the things that you're telling me to do. I'm like, you're right. You're right. You're right. It's one of those, um, you know, we don't want to be so much of the do as I say, not as I do kind of situations where I know, you know, it takes a lot of practice and it's, it's intentional and purposeful. I know Winnicott said, there's no such thing as a baby, or I think he said, I think there's no such thing as an infant. It's always um, a baby and a, a mother. And, you know, it's, we always go back to having that relationship and it's, it's as we're teaching and growing and modeling, it's a very give and take uh, flow. And so we want children to be mindful and we're working on it ourselves too. Um, and then also actually on the next slide, I have something related, I think, a lot of times, so we know the best practices as far as, um, you know, we really should be incorporating that self-care as far as, you know, exercising, connecting with friends, like Laura was saying, um, uh, taking time off. Um, and I think that when we're able to do it, definitely best practice. I think sometimes what we run into is we get so busy um, with our lives where we feel like we can't justify it. Or if there's so much happening for our families and children, sometimes we feel like, oh, I just, um, I just can't take the time right now. It, it, you know, whether you're feeling like it's selfish or physically there's just no time. And so in those moments, I kind of invite um, a child, a, a shift in perspective where as long as we're going into something intentionally and purposefully and um, saying this moment is for myself, it doesn't have to be a longer period of time. It can still do the same thing. And it really struck me recently, I was um, attending a training and the trainer was talking about self-care and she was talking about um, with her friend um, saying, you know, she, uh, just she had she really wanted to do yoga but she didn't have the hour to do it so it's just like you know i only have 15 minutes it's not really yoga and so her friend just kind of stopped and told her just because it's 15 minutes why is it not real yoga and so i was just like oh you know what you're right <laughs> and so again it's that um it goes back to that intentionality and so whether it's we're going to the grocery store and before we go in we take a minute to kind of lean back in the seat and listen to one extra song or you're going to take the long way um into work or to the mailbox you can even kind of bring your kids into it because i know especially with covid there are a lot of times where we don't have that separation whether we're working from home and our kids are home with us how can we incorporate those moments there too and so even just kind of throwing down a blanket and you know you're going to eat dinner and call it a picnic that day and everyone's going to watch a show and you're going to take that moment together so again having that intention of this is what i'm going to do purposefully and it might not be a lot of time but it's what it's the little time i'm going to give myself helps to kind of change that dynamic and replenish ourselves a little bit more that really connects to expectations doesn't it amy and really being saying what what do we really need we and being in relationship what what do we really need and it doesn't have to be this big mad this big magic thing just small powerful moments mm -hmm. and that uh that kind of just is that gentleness towards ourselves and it adds up so continuing with that um what we've talked about just so far in our short time together is taking care of ourselves um including our children in um in 
ways that allow them to um, grow, to practice those mindful moments. And we want to make sure, as Laura shared earlier, that we do it in a way that's developmentally appropriate for them, that we're not asking them to go outside at, you know, at three years old and ride a, a, a bicycle without ever sitting on a tricycle first. And so um, just being mindful of our developmental expectations is important in allowing our children to be successful um, when challenging opportunities later on in their life do come up. So ways in which we can support our child's developmental expectations is through modeling and through doing with our child. So um, Amy and I talked about this. We were supposed to be planning for one of our presentations um, a couple of months ago, and we got a little off topic as we like to do. And we were talking about reading with our children and our children um, are not early learners at this point. They are a little older. And we were talking about road trips over spring break and ways in which to engage with our kids. And we talked about the joy of listening to audible books together with our children. And our, my children are 17 and 19 and Amy's children are a little bit younger. And then we incorporated this conversation with Laura, I think the next time we all got together. And so when they're young, that joy of reading, spending that uninterrupted time together um, is, is just a beautiful way to connect with our children and to show them the importance of being a lifelong learner through reading. And it doesn't end. We still go on road trips at this point and we still pick out podcasts as a family together. Um, and books together. And it's something that if you ask my, my children, you know, when you go on vacation, what are, what are some of your highlight memories? It'll start from the car. It'll start from those times together listening to um, our Harry Potter books. So um, continue to read with your children, especially um, our youngest children, because that, you know, nurturing that love for our books is just so important. Um, I remember my sister-in-law, when um, she came to visit us, when my kids were younger, they were about three and five, we took them to Barnes and Noble. And at that time, my, my children did not understand that that was like a bookstore where you actually go in and you, you're supposed to buy books. I think they still thought of it as a library. It was just still joy for them to be around books. And when we left that one particular time without buying books, her kids are a little older. She was like, wow. She goes, how come your kids weren't begging to buy this, that, and the other thing? I said, because right now, it's just the joy of reading together that motivates them to want to do these things. And um, there was a point where, yes, they realized that, oh, they actually could take these home forever, um, and that's okay. But just, again, modeling for them that time um, together, especially by reading, is just, it's a lifelong gift you can give your children. Some of the other things that we can um, in um, encourage our children to do with us is to help them with simple chores. Um, I love that little guy in the bottom corner um, with the with the mop or the broom. That that could have been my son. I mean, he with such zest would clean our house. Um, he thought, and and he was being so helpful. It just gave him such pride in um, in helping us um, with those simple things, those simple chores. Now that we are encouraging our children to be with others, uh, we definitely also want to encourage play. Um, I know Laura and Amy, this is, this is a, a, a very important um, topic for them. Get our children out to the playground, let them be children again and interact with their peers, their siblings, their cousins. Um, try to let them on their own work out problems versus us jumping in and trying to fix it for them. If you see it's go going south, then they do need some modeling and guidance from parents, but see if they can figure it out themselves. Um, our rules do need to be consistent um, because the, our children are looking for those guidelines. So that can be um, certainly part of that learning experience. Laura, did you want to share something? Oh yes, yeah, sorry to interrupt. No, I, I reflect a lot on hide and seek, you know, that, that game of, of um, the child hiding and the adult finding them. And um, when our children were really little, there was this moment where my son, he was probably three and he hid like right in front of the couch. I mean, why, did, I mean, he, and so I counted and, and you know, the, it, here I am. And I was thinking, 
you didn't even really hide, but you really like to, you really like being found. That's, that's, and then I realized the joy of being discovered is so exciting. And the reason I mentioned this story about hide and seek, so the theme there is I see you, I'm looking for you, I find you, I'm, you know, and um, staying in connection. Some of the, what I do notice is for some of our children who didn't have, our young ones who didn't have as many opportunities for some of that kind of just spontaneous play moments. Um, we see some of those needs to do some of the, the, the playful, even things like hide and seek, even as children are a little older too. Mm -hmm. So we wanna uh, kind of welcome some of those moments and children can show us through their play some of the things that are meaningful to them. And they love being seen and noticed and, um, you know, when it's the climbing on the, uh, on the, on the ladder, like, look at me, look what I've done. I see you. I see that, you know, exactly how to climb and giving them some of that, um, the verbal presence and noticing that, that they have those capabilities. And, and let's say they can't get onto the next rung and they might need a little help and giving them that just right level of support so that they still feel competent, but they also have that support maybe to get to that next that next ladder rung. Um, so just a note and uh, I'll stop talking. I can talk about play all the time. Amy, do you have, I'll stop, go ahead. Amy, do you have things to add around play? And no, just the big thing too, is I know um, there's a lot of emphasis on structure and team sports. And, you know, I think there are a lot of benefits with that, but, you know, also, if we're able to incorporate any of that unstructured time too, because that's where we get a lot of the, the cause and effect, the learning, the negotiating, um, uh, that opportunity for that to happen organically. And to build on that, I, and I can tell you from experience with older kids, my children have a hard time being bored. They don't know what to do when they don't have something structured to do. And I wish that I could turn back that clock and allow them to be bored more at home so they could figure it out on their own. So I encourage you with younger children to allow your ch child or children to explore within the home, outside of the home, things that allow them to become unbored on their own in, in within a safe environment. Just put out some Legos. Um, maybe put out some Play-Doh, let them explore, let them explore in your backyard while supervised. Um, because as they get older and we have more challenges with technology and, and other influences around them, at least personally, it, it, they lose some of that. And so we want to continue to encourage. So we're trying to actually have our, our older children in the car say we have no electronic time for blocks of time on our road trips. And we have to figure out what we're gonna do because going back to the license plate game, which we used to do, or the find different shapes game. I mean, this is what we're doing with our, with our teenagers now because we need to bring that back to, to rewire our brain so that we can figure out what to do with that time. Maybe it's just time to, to um, meditate, do yoga, um, do some seat push-ups, whatever it might be, but they, but we want to encourage them to figure out some of this on their own. Um, just a couple of other things before we move on to the next slide. Games, family game night, such a joy for, for my family. Um, my daughter is now home from, from college. And again, this is kind of like your future telling, showing you what could happen. Um, she came home and the very next night, we started our game nights because that's something that brings our families together. We get to model what it's like when we're not winning. We get to model what it's like to be a, a good sport when we are winning, taking turns, sharing, problem solving. And this is something that we started with our children at a very, very young age with the very simple matching games, shoots and ladders. Um, and it is something that allows your family time to just come together uninterrupted, that modeling is going on, you're practicing your problem solving skills, um, you're allowing them to um, show some independence 
in choices that they have to make. And it is just such a wonderful opportunity to watch them grow um, through playing games. So we certainly encourage you to do that with your family. That was a lot of developmental expectations wrapped up in a lot of different examples. So um, we hope that you have a lot of takeaways from, from this or things you're already doing and you're like, oh, I make that connection. I need to do more of that. Or, oh, we kind of do that, but you know what? We have a nice three-day weekend coming up. We're gonna go um, and explore and take a nature walk because um, we need a little, we just need a little time together. So enjoy that, those moments. So when our students, our students, see, always an educator also. When our children um, show us that they're really having a hard time maybe expressing um, why they're responding to something that might be either challenging or hard or confusing to them, we want to just make sure and be mindful of the fact that they may not really be able to label the feeling. So when we say to our children, gosh, how are you feeling about that? Or why, you know, why is this bothering you? We just want to um, share um, this keyboard. It's called the Jensen's keyboard. Or he, he, he's um, an educator and a researcher, and he has a book called Teaching with Poverty in Mind. And although his focus was on children who are dealing with uh, poverty, it is really true for all children. What he shares is that our children are, are hardwired to understand basic emotions. They understand sadness, joy, disgust, things they don't like, anger, things that surprise them, and fear. All of those other 10 um, emotions that are listed on the two sides are things that need to actually be taught. Our children don't necessarily understand it unless we as parents, your teachers of your students, your aunts and uncles of your children, um, teach this to them. It's really hard to understand forgiveness if it's not modeled. So we have to teach them. If our student um, or your child makes a mistake and we can give them a hug afterwards and say, it's okay, that hurt, that, you know, that whatever the it was that hurt me, but I forgive you. I love you. It's okay. Let's see how we can make this better next time. Or if we do something wrong, let's say we yell at our child because we had one of those moments because we're human. We can say to the to our children, you know what? I hope you can forgive me for yelling. That's not the way I, I want to share how I'm feeling. Do you forgive me? If you forgive me, let's let's give each other a hug and go do something together. So you're again, modeling what that looks like on both ends, because we want to be those role models for our children. So when I first learned about this many years ago, I just thought this was fascinating that, um, that we really have to teach our children all of these feelings and pair it with an, with an experience so that they can understand it fully. Laura and Amy, anything to add to this? I think I would add, give, you were talking, Lori, about reading books and listening to books, and it can be very helpful to ask, mm -hmm. you know, how, what is your thought about what that character is? Mm -hmm. What's that like for that character? And when we do that listening, we understand a lot more about where our children are in terms of that awareness. And there may be more, more conversation that just follows. And those kinds of shared experiences can then be a vehicle for um, doing some of these some, some of these teaching moments. I remember we, um, I was at the grocery store a number of years ago, and we helped someone whose some items had fallen out of their cart. And so we were walking back to the car, and I said, "So how? Do you, what, what did you notice about what what happened?" And so we unpacked that a little bit, and. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate those moments that sometimes we can't plan for that just show up mm -hmm. that allow us. And sometimes it's not in the moment. Maybe it's later. Um, the, the gratitude one really uh, captures my attention because when we express, when our children see us expressing gratitude to one another, to them, to neighbors, 
noticing and saying you know, what you did helped me or I appreciate this, that then they begin to pair it with that experience. And then that some of those teachable moments there. I love the suggestion of using books as a teachable moment for our, um, for our emotional growth as well, because it really takes it off of us. And sometimes it's easier to talk about things when it's not so personal. So when it's about a character, it might open up a whole nother conversation that you may not have expected. So um, that was a, a wonderful suggestion. Thank you. So just as a guideline, um, we just wanted to share this with you. This is from the CDC um, website. And we do have, like many of you had requested last time, we do have a one pager to share with you with a lot of the links to these resources for you to access um, either during or after our time together. And in case you were just wondering what would be appropriate for my five-year-old or what is appropriate for my seven-year-old, um, and again, guidelines. It doesn't mean if they're five, they have to be doing these things. It just means these are things that we look for to make sure that, um, you know, at some point around that age that they're able to do. And if they haven't had an opportunity yet to ride a tricycle or try to cut on their own with safety scissors, and they are five, it might be something that you considered um, trying with your child. So um, I'm not going to read all of these because um, we want to give you that opportunity to peruse them on your own, but just know that um, we, if we're asking a child, our child, to do something that isn't necessarily developmentally appropriate for them, we might see behaviors that tell us, I'm not ready for this yet, or at least I'm not ready to do this on my own yet. So use those behaviors as that form of communication to give us that red flag of, hmm, What's going on? And if something really is concerning to you, let's say um, you are, are having a conversation with your child and they're really struggling to um, recall a story that you've read to them every single night for the past month, we have resources out there. Start with your pediatrician, to let them know um, what your child is doing, what you might have as a concern, They'll let you know if it's something you really need to be concerned about or if it's something that you should just watch. Um, otherwise, our county is just a wealth of resources for you to access if you do need, and we'll, we can talk a little bit about that um, a little later this morning together. And here it is. <laughs> yeah. A little more about that too. And also what Lori was mentioning as far as um, some of those indicators. Sometimes, I mean, we know what we know. There's, there's so much about development and the different areas. And, you know, some, a lot of what I hear is, oh, I, when I'm asking different questions about developmental stages, um, a parent might just respond with saying, I just, I didn't, I, they haven't had the opportunity. I, I didn't know we were supposed to do that. And it's okay. There's no like, um, hard and fast things you're supposed to present at different ages. But I think what's nice about some of those checklists too is it gives you ideas of things to introduce um, and to explore. And so a lot of the times too, whether it's cutting or fine motor or different games or activities, um, it does give you ideas. So it's okay if it's not been introduced. Um, it, it just gives you um, ideas to kind of present later. Another uh, question that we get a lot is, when should I be concerned? When is it time to refer? And so what I want to emphasize is when it comes to early childhood development, so we, on the left, you see, we kind of parsed out the different developmental areas we can look at. In early childhood, a lot of these are connected. So it's not unusual. Um, if you see some challenges or concerns in one area, you're going to see some in another area as well. I mean, if you're thinking of receptive communication and following directions, that's a little bit tied to the cognitive expectations too, depending on age. Um, and as Lori was mentioning, some of that memory recall, you know, some of the nonverbals with the cognitive, the social emotional um, sleep we talked about last time, physical health. And when you get the, um, the handout we were talking about um, and you look at the different areas, one of them is uh, communication. And that one is um, 
you know, even goes down to how many words in a sentence should my three-year-old be using or what are acceptable sound substitutions if they're saying F every time they um, are supposed to say TH um, or, you know, that kind of thing, just to give you an idea. And as Lori was mentioning too, you can always touch base with your pediatrician. So where I kind of tell parents is um, if you're noticing challenges in any of these areas to the extent where it's making them difficult to engage in activities or routines, then go ahead and reach out um, and uh, see if you can get more information. And that's what we're here for and designed to do. Um, also, you know, I say always go with your gut. So if your pediatrician is saying generally this is okay, um, but you're thinking, well, just from what I know, I'm still a little bit concerned. It doesn't hurt to reach out to us too. And so we can give that information. We can ask the questions. We can even do some screenings um, to kind of just get more information and see, do we want to look further into this? Does it seem pretty um, typical? It doesn't hurt to get more information. So that's why in the bottom, I'm saying when in doubt, reach out. But again, when it gets to the point where it's becoming difficult to engage in just activities or routine, then you wanna um, kind of get more information. So um, on the right, I just wanna explain a few things. FCPS Child Find, that's through us. And so if your child is between the ages of two and five, you would be calling that number for more information. If your child is between the ages of zero to three, you would be calling the infant and toddler connection of Fairfax Falls Church. And again, that information is in that handout um, that we're gonna send to everybody. And so um, FCPS Child Find, because we're through the school system, everything is free. Infant and toddler connection, it is um, up through the assessment that is free as well. And then they um, charge insurance and they have sliding scales and everything after that if assessment or um, if intervention is needed. Again, there's specialists too um, that the pediatrician can help kind of guide you in different directions. So for example, if you notice sleep is an issue, um, and they're recommending going to an ENT or um, getting a sleep study. They can help with that. Private providers, um, I know that there's a range of what's covered with insurance or out of, pocket, uh, out of pocket and what have you, but there are private providers for speech therapists, occupational, physical, um, that kind of thing. So another place to access. But um, you know, there's a range of things. And again, I really want to emphasize at least some of the free things, but it, it never hurts to just reach out and get more information. Okay, so I will we'll take an imagination moment just very quickly. When you look at this image on the screen and put in the chat, maybe something that comes to mind for you, what it could be, um, if, it, if it was anything, if you could make it into something. What could it be? Catch it. Yes. Like, are there any pictures or images it looks like to you? Art. Okay. A flying pig. Thank you. A flying pig. So a child's been, yes, normal. One. Yes, it sounds like it shows a good image. Uh, a pig coming out of the water. Okay, so this is really just uh, kind of taking on a life of its own. I was kind of see a sailboat. No. You see, a, okay, you see a sailboat. Any other noticing? So this is such a good example of witch on a broom. Oh, yeah, there is no every answer. This is how you see it, right? This is a little like the example when I'm with kids or even adults can do this. We pass around a um, paper towel roll and say, make it into anything you want it to be, right? It can be anything you want it to be. So we have freedom to look at this without having to clean it up. How's that, right? Is the shirt ruined? Exactly. That's why I put the oops in red because it's, these are tough moments, these oops moments. So I made up this word opportunities because I, um, there was a, a, a time when my children were very young and we had a lot of spills. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to tell you, I did a lot of spilling. Definitely. Some of the spilling was mine, my own, but I would overreact. I would overreact. And then sometimes raise my, raise my voice. And I, and here I am, I'm in the field of mental health, talking to, to people about, you know, good strategies. And I'm like, this is really a piece of humble pie or humble ketchup, whatever you want to call it. So I, I decided that I was going to, 
pause and um, two things. I made up a very silly song so that every time I said to myself, every time it spills, I spill it or someone spills from now on, we are singing this song. And I won't sing it for you, I'll tell you the words. It's, it's um, um, we all spill, even Uncle Will. We don't have an Uncle Will. But um, just saying that, was singing that, and I, I don't have the greatest voice, was very goofy and funny. Then I would ask the children, just take a look and see what this looks like. Crescent moon, whatever the thing, look, whatever the little spill looked like. And not like we're seeking out spills. Oh, let's spill so we can see, no. But it, what it did, it brought a different association to this moment, this oops moment, right? So the concept here is that um, we all have these moments, or at least I have these moments, and we want to look at how we can grow through these moments. Um, and we can grow, not just get through them, but we can grow through them. And so the other example I'll share quickly about opportunities is that um, when I was seeing adult clients in private practice, uh, my children were very young, and I had to leave a message for an adult client. And I had to re-record it like seven times because it kept getting interrupted. So by the, by, by the eighth time, I said, um, hi, this is Laurie Tiemann. I, I'm just calling you back to it. I said, oh, Veronica, mommy will be right there. And, and I'll be right there as soon as I'm done. I finished my message. I hung up. I'm in session with the client. She said, um, Laurie, I want to thank you for the message you left. And, all, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's that message. I couldn't get it right. She said it was so healing. And I was kind of like, what? She said, because I saw that you were a person like anyone else. And I'm thinking, well, of course I'm a person. But here's the part. She, she saw that life happens, right? And we stay with it and we do what we need to do. And we're present, we keep showing up. And so that was a real healing moment for me because I said, this isn't about getting it all perfect. Like, any, like I don't anyway, but this is about getting through these moments and then also looking for the things that maybe we wouldn't have learned or seen or noticed, um, you know, with, with these, these oopses that turn into growing moments. That's what, that's what this catch-up slide is about. And I appreciate everyone's, everyone's uh, participation in that, in that moment. So, um, so we'll, uh, we'll move on. I definitely see the pig now. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's interesting that you say that too, because I'm reflecting as you're saying the seventh message, you know, you had such a calm, I'll be right there. I don't know if my tone would have been the same with my children at that point too. And I think, you know, we, we emphasize a lot, Laura and Lori and I, about how we go through our things too. And I know you've heard me talk about my son a lot throughout this series. And I always think like he was put in my life <laughs> to give me perspective for all these trainings. Um, and so it is, you know, it's something that we're all trying and negotiating and navigating. And so we, we understand and, you know, we do our best to be mindful and learn and to connect. And I think um, part of that too is when we're talking about, you know, I know we've been saying there's a lot of language and behavior and what is this behavior trying to communicate? And so from a behavioral analysis perspective, they um, have what is called functions of behavior and there's four different areas. Um, and here you see escape or delay, access to tangibles, need for attention and sensory simulation. And again, functions just meaning what are the motivations or, um, and Lori, she's our expert, jump in if I'm getting this wrong, uh, <laughs> are the, the intent behind some of the actions. And so um, with escape or delay, this is something that we're seeing. It, it could be just, just what it says. They're um, delaying a transition, like going to bed or um, having to go to school or um, trying to get out of bath time or, take, or ending electronic time, whatever it is. But what I'm seeing a lot too, um, especially in the preschool ages, is sometimes it's also trying to escape stronger, uncomfortable feelings like embarrassment or shame. And sometimes seeing uh, some acting out as a result of that, or even trying to change the narrative or um, change the, that feeling. And so uh, there are things that we can do in those early ages too. You know, we've been talking about labeling and identifying those things, but then also giving some key phrases, especially as communication is something that might be developing still, where it's like, uh oh, help please, or um, kind of noting a specific um, action instead of making it uh, personalizing it a little bit. So if 
you know, a child is feeling it, sad about a tower falling down or something and you know where his sister is able to kind of execute it perfectly we can just kind of label what's happening to address it oh you know the blocks got really shaky and then it started falling down and so it's not this is what you did this is you know how you should fix it or i'm good i'm you know we're not saying get over it it's fine kind of addressing it and then kind of bringing attention to the what of it um instead of um and kind of giving those problem solving skills too at the same time. And then also just providing those consistent boundaries. And we'll talk more about boundaries and limits in a second. Uh, so that again, the consistency in the routine kind of takes out some of those curtain calls too. Um, the access to tangibles, it's the same where, you know, you, you your child wants candy in the store or they want tablet time or they want um, to grab certain snacks. And um, I think that part of what we can do is we going back to our perspective of we want to set our children up for success. And so in the meantime, if that means they're always getting into the snack drawer, can we put it in a place where maybe it's not as easily accessible? Um, and again, we ultimately would love for our children to be in a place where they can think about what they want, think about the consequences and make choices accordingly. And that would be great. But sometimes as a four-year-old is learning everything else, we want to kind of build up to it slowly. And so in the meantime, you know, giving them the opportunity to build for success, giving clear um, expectations, like in, in the store, we're only going to get oranges and milk, and then we're going to come back, kind of communicating that clearly. Um, or also providing choices. So there's at least some control of the opportunity. You know, you can't have cookies, but you can have a granola bar or pretzels, um, just kind of giving some alternatives. Uh, need for attention. I think even for myself, I, I'm trying to kind of think about how do I, I feel like I, I, sometimes I like a lot of attention, sometimes I don't, it depends on the situation. But even with my husband, the other day, sometimes if I feel like I need more attention, I'll just sit next to him and I'll kind of lean into him. And that's like my nonverbal. And it, sometimes it's picked up, sometimes it's not. And, you know, I think about that too with my son. Even this morning, it was a lot of, see, I'm talking about my son again. Um, him saying, there's a really cool game I think you should look at. Uh, there's a really cool game I think you should look at and kind of just repeating it and repeating it. And so finally it was like, oh, wait a second, what is, what is he needing right now? And so it took just a second for me to kind of respond back. Um, it sounds like there's a game you really want to tell me about. And so being able to kind of connect for a second, uh, have him, uh, present the information and I know, so there's some uh, research out there too that says even five minutes of purposeful attention each day with each child um, can help mitigate some of those needs too. And um, I also know that there are situations where that's just not always feasible, like on the phone or um, like other things. And so I think it was on the other slide where we're practicing patience as a skill building too. Um, and so you know, understanding that there's times where you have to wait, and then we're we still want to be able to reinforce that um, that the practicing of patience was great. So as soon as you get off the phone, thank you so much for waiting. Um, it looked like you wanted to show me something. Do you want to go ahead and do that? And so we're both kind of reinforcing the waiting and the patience, and then we're also say um, rewarding it with, uh, I am giving you my full attention now because sometimes too situations could be where um, if a child is kind of repeatedly feeling that unmet need, sometimes they're going to do the bigger, more catastrophic actions where it might be more negative attention seeking. But what happens is at that moment, that caregiver is forced to stop what they're doing and come attend to that situation. And so what the child could be seeing is, oh, wait a second, I made them stop and now I have unadulterated <laughs> attention. This is excellent. And I know that happens sometimes, but it's also a check for us to kind of say, um, I'm noticing this is happening a lot lately. You know, maybe we used to do a lot of those board games and we're not doing that anymore because of work or what have you. And so maybe it's just a check for us to say, okay, let's, let's see how we can connect again and kind of infuse those times a little bit. Um, for sensory simulation, there's whole trainings on just sensory alone. And that's just basically 
um, how our body receives information through our different senses like vision, touch, taste, smell, everything um, to give us a sense of where our body is in space and how we um, can work within an environment. And so sometimes you're going to see whether it's um, where we're sensory seeking or um, more sensitive is like with touch, if you see children who really love jumping or crashing or spinning, hanging upside down, um, and some sensitivities it could be with some smells or textures with food or um, different lights or sounds. And I think all of us adults and um, children, we have different ranges and a degree of what we're needing and um, some what we're a little more defensive with. And I think for the most part, again, if we're able to incorporate um, basic things that kind of meet that need, like a safe crash area or going outside and giving extra time for that, um, that, that can meet the need. And actually, if you go online, even looking um, just for more information, there's tons of great ideas out there about that. Um, and then going back to when we might need more support, again, if they're continually needing that sensory stimulation or that, um, uh, defensiveness to the point where it's hard for them to complete an activity or move forward with anything, then it's okay to kind of reach out and say, you know, whether it's with your pediatrician or an occupational therapist um, to say, these are some of the things I've been noticing. Um, is this something we should explore? Uh, and then Laura, I'm not sure if I'm missing anything too with this. Okay. Nope, I think that covered it. You can, you can escape or access anything. So some people want more sensory input, some people want to escape it, some people want more attention, some people want to escape it. And not everybody wants it one way all the time. Sometimes you want to escape attention as Amy said, and other times you want it. It's just being aware of what the, like, as we talked about earlier, what those behaviors are trying to communicate to us. And so part of helping us be aware too, is just some reflective practices. And so this is one by Killian and Sean that is just kind of a more specific reflecting in, on, and for action, something that we can kind of concretely go through. And so, um, so one example of how this works is, let's say uh, there was a moment with my son when he was younger, when we were at Target, where he had a full on meltdown of all meltdowns on the floor, kicking and screaming. Um, nothing was helping or soothing the situation where I had to kind of leave the cart, pick him up, go and just leave. And so, and it was even to the point where I was really so angry that we had to go sit in front of the, um, a bench in front of the store. And I just had to put him next to me while I cooled down and then kind of continued and went to the car. And so um, that was what happened in action. Later, when we're all cooled down a little bit, I'm thinking about, okay, let me reflect on action about what happened. So just breaking it down, what happened that day? Um, you know, was it during the witching hour? Was he hungry? Did we maybe push it with too many, um, uh, what's the word? Um, chore, or not chores. You know, when you're uh, when you're having to go through and do all the like the uh, errands, too many. Yes, errands, errands, errands okay. sorry. Yeah, got it. Um, you know, was it too many errands, one too many? And then I had to really think about, too, I don't usually. Yes, I have a temper, but I don't usually get to the point where I have to kind of take a break, even going to the car. And so I'm like, where was I at that day, too? You know, what what was I going through? Was I massively hungry? Was I hot and tired? I mean, we were in Texas and it gets hot there. So what was happening there? And so then as I'm thinking about those things, the next time we have that opportunity of going to Target or any situation like that, I'm gonna reflect for action. So I'm gonna say, this is fresh off nap time. He's had a good snack. Um, I've you know, had a good snack as well. I have a good cup of coffee. We're good to go. I have a list of things I need, but these are the must haves. And then if um, I can at least get those and if we have to leave, that's fine. Kind of preparing for that situation so that when we're in the moment, if it should come up again, I'm a little more prepared and I'm a little um, more aware of what to anticipate and what I can do instead. So I feel like I have, um, more options at my disposal that I'm ready to do so that when it comes to that moment, I will be um, 
uh, more informed and it can translate into other areas too. So it's just not just target, but any kind of situation like that. And so this too gives us that opportunity to really take the time to think because in the moment too, sometimes we get frazzled and it's hard to kind of just be able to take a second and think too. So it's okay for it to happen after and before the fact, because we're still kind of being mindful of the situation. And it's something that we can model for our kids too. Um, and help them walk through. I remember my daughter uh, was really upset one day about uh, what somebody said to her at summer camp. And so we were talking about the situation. We talked about um, things that she wishes happened differently, information she wishes she had, things she wants to try. And so that when she was having a situation um, when she had to go back and was potentially in that situation again for that four action, she was thinking, okay, I'm about to, you know, it's going to be that water day again. This is what I'll say. This is what I'll try. So that if it happens again, she was more prepared to. So it's something we can walk through with our kids as well. And then can I jump to the next slide? So we've been talking a lot about skill building and um, importance of routines and uh, different strategies and tools. And one thing um, that's uh, a strategy too and something important to incorporate is limit setting and boundaries. And um, again, just you know, for the case of limit setting, this is um, this particular activity is from Dr. Our um, framework is from Dr. Gary Landreth, who's a um, seminal figure in play therapy. But what he is saying about the importance of limit setting too is limits, or I'm sorry, limits promote consistency. Without consistency, there's no predictability. And without predictability, there can be no security. And so my friend Julia Yuri gave me permission to use her, her pool analogy example. If you've ever been in a public or community pool, sometimes you see that, that rope that cuts across where it's um, the deeper end and the shallow end. And so when we have a concept of where that line is, we know this whole area, I can go and play and splash around and I don't have to worry about getting too deep or um, panicking because I don't know how to swim, um, anything like that consistently. I'm, I'm trusting that line and where it is. If that line moves a little or it's not there, then sometimes children really want to test kind of where that line is because they need to know definitively because they, they want to be able to feel secure so they could focus on playing and growing and doing all that fun stuff. And children are really very much aware that they are entirely dependent on caregivers. Um, they need to know, um, they need their support for just basic living skills, but then also um, safety and knowing um, that they'll, they'll be protected. And so again, that's really kind of that understanding of the importance of boundaries and limits too. And it's about that predictability with their caregiver. And so it's just like, they know consistently, um, this is how my caregiver will respond and caregiver meaning not just within the family, but within childcare and preschool too. Um, I, I know that this is going to happen, so then I can focus on this, this other stuff because I know where that line is. And so uh, what I like about that ACT approach is that um, it is something that's concrete. It can be very matter of fact, and it is... Um, easy to kind of just prepare for ahead of time too. If you know there's a situation that happens a lot that you kind of want to take the time to dissect a little bit. And then that way, when it happens again, some of that reflecting um, in on and for action, you're ready and prepared to kind of prevent or to present um, some of these limits. And so um, just breaking it down uh, for A, acknowledging the child's feelings. So you can say something like, I know you're mad that I took that away or you're having fun and you don't wanna turn the tablet off. Um, see communicating the limit, but people aren't for hitting, or um, we heard the timer, it's time to turn it off. And then T, targeting acceptable alternatives, just saying, you know, you can hit this pillow or you can shout I'm mad, or you can turn it off or I can turn it off. And so we're presenting these options, we're acknowledging the feelings, and but we're keeping it kind of matter of fact and clear. And so I think that, you know, the recommendation is you can present this 
up to three times. Um, but then if a choice isn't made, then you can provide um, kind of that the final choice where you know, if you choose, and we want to emphasize the word choose, because also we, when we're talking about skill building, we're talking about practicing ways to do self control and mindfulness and um, thinking there uh, with that too. So you can choose to hit me, or if you choose to hit me, you choose to lose movie time. If you choose to stop, you get to choose to keep your movie choice. And again, too, um, sometimes um, you, you kind of, uh, it, it's a way you can keep it quick and describe all these things, you'll see that there are moments where it's easier to kind of present this. So when it's again, full meltdown choice, sometimes it's hard. And so we just have to provide like the, the quick version um, or kind of wait for a de-escalation. But there's a lot of sometimes buildup where they're in that mode where they might be more receptive to hear it. So we're kind of trying to target those areas. And also if you're looking at, um, again, another, uh, Thing. If you're researching just Gary Landreth, ACT, there's also tons of examples too, if you need um, things to help out. And I know Laura's also used this as well. I don't know if you have anything else to add. Oh, thank you so much. Are we um, speaking, of, I'm going to model this. I feel like we could we could continue sharing all day. I want to acknowledge how we feel. See, I, I want to check, are we up against our time limit? And how might we respond to questions and make sure we have time? So Lisa, I want to kind of do a little time check. If sure, I it's about 11.07 now. We have until 11.30. So, so exciting. Yeah, so do you want to go for just a little bit more oh, and then yeah. we'll go to questions? Yeah, oh, okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, when I just started learning about the ACT model about eight years ago, I thought, well, let me let me try this out. And one of my kids picked up a crayon and started rushing to the wall to write on it. So I was like, okay, uh, you really wish that, that you could write on that wall with a crayon. Sometimes you don't have time to do that first part, but when we do, um, the wall isn't for writing and you can write on the newspaper, you can write on the uh, paper, you know, and, or you can do chalk outside. And I remember, it was so freeing to be able to hold that wonderful desire, right? Like I gotta, I wanna, I wanna put this somewhere, right? Without sort of judging it, I'm not explain it. So one of the ways I, one of the reasons I love this so much is because children bring intense anger and frustration and fear and all those emotions are so important. And we wanna honor and give them a place to be able to, um, to direct that energy so that they have that experience of my big emotions are safe with you. And this is a process of learning, by the way, because for me growing up, I didn't have a lot of help with managing disappointment. My mom sort of just tried to take it away. And she and I've talked about this. And then I became a parent and I'm like, I just wanna take away all my children's disappointment. And then I realized that's probably not the greatest thing. Disappointment is part of, it's part of life. I need to start working on it. Then I was in my thirties and start to, to teach that uh, more. So, um, yes, and it also helps keep things a little more streamlined too, because I know sometimes we might run into the mixed messages where we say kind of like, um, do you think you wanna start maybe cleaning up a little bit where if you're gonna ask me like that, I'm gonna say no, like um, versus it's time to clean up right now, or you know, you're having a lot of fun, but it's time to clean up. Um, and so it keeps things clear that way. And I know sometimes when we present some information like this, we say, yeah, it sounds good on paper, but what about in real life? I promise you, this is something that I've been using actually a lot this year in real time with parents. And so I, you know, we are both the recipient of like the angry crayon throwing at me or, you know, the hitting or the pinching. And we've been able to present this. And I think the key is the consistency. So the more consistent you are with the limit, you're going to see the difference. And again, it, it takes practice to kind of say it like this too. And sometimes you kind of only have the time to spit out um, the alternatives and that's okay as we kind of work through that. But again, it's the consistency. Um, and based on that, I was going to show a, another video, but based on time, how about we just show this? And then if we have time at the end, we can go through the other one. Cause I want to make sure we have time for questions too. Okay. Not so long ago, many scientists believe that the brain did not change after childhood. 
that it was hardwired and fixed by the time we became adults. But recent advances in only the last decade now tell us that this is simply not true. The brain can and does change throughout our lives. It is adaptable, like plastic. Hence neuroscientists call this neuroplasticity. How does neuroplasticity work? If you think of your brain as a dynamic, connected power grid, there are billions of pathways or roads lighting up every time you think, feel or do something. Some of these roads are well-traveled. These are our habits, our established ways of thinking, feeling and doing. Every time we think in a certain way, practice a particular task or feel a specific emotion, we strengthen this road. It becomes easier for our brains to travel this pathway. Say we think about something differently, learn a new task or choose a different emotion. We start carving out a new road. If we keep traveling that road, our brains begin to use this pathway more and this new way of thinking, feeling or doing becomes second nature. The old pathway gets used less and less and weakens. This process of rewiring your brain by forming new connections and weakening old ones is neuroplasticity in action. The good news is that we all have the ability to learn and change by rewiring our brains. If you have ever changed a bad habit or thought about something differently, you have carved a new pathway in your brain and experienced neuroplasticity firsthand. With repeated and directed attention towards your desired change, you can rewire your brain. Again, too, just that idea of, you know, we're, we're presenting sometimes new information um, and new strategies and new skills. And sometimes we get frustrated because it's like, oh, you know, it's not working. It's, it's, it's the same thing again. And again, it's just having that consistency and setting up our children for success. If we need to break it down, if, um, if we needed a, a try and approach differently too, to be consistent gives that new reinforcement, that new pathway. So we know, okay, this is another skill that we can use that works as well. Okay, so in the interest of time, we'll take a quick moment uh, to, to do another check-in. And if there's a feeling here, uh, a froggy feeling that, that you notice that you put in the chat, and if, especially if there was a shift from um, in any way from the first check-in to now, it's kind of that, that paying attention uh, to ourselves. Um, so if, if you'd like to put, put that in the um, chat, that'd be great. And then we'll um, kind of come down the home stretch here. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Calm and happy. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. I hope people feel, feel encouraged and affirmed and also that kind of um, bite size uh, steps that are incremental. Um, that frog and toad, speaking of frog, there's a frog and toad book about frog makes a list, you know, of all things he wants to do. I always put things in my list I've already done and check it off now. It's already done that, feel a little good. So you got to work with our wiring sometimes and be a little gentle with ourselves. All right. Okay. Thank you for, um, oh, anxious to calm. Okay. So thanks for the, so this kind of noticing of our own selves and our energy and how we're doing um, without judgment. It's really kind, kindness towards ourselves. That's a gift to not only ourselves, but also our children. Okay, Lori. All right, so big shift, big change. School, whether it's preschool, kindergarten, first grade is about to come to a close. And here comes summer. Everything we just talked about, structures, expectations, um, are about to potentially go out the window. So what we thought would be helpful is to provide you with just some local um, activities that you might want to engage um, or participate in with your children. We have four links. I'm going to have to actually, because I'm presenting, um, I'm going to have to come out of the presentation. And we just want to very quickly show you um, the four websites that have some great information on it. These are included in your, um, in your um, one pager. So if you don't mind for one second, I'm just going to come out of here. 
and come down to these links so that I can show you very quickly what they are. The first one is on our FCPS um, website. And there are just some fun activities that you can um, do with your child. So read alouds aligns with exactly what we were talking about too. Different places to visit, calendars, um, some professional articles that have activities and even a video. A lot of things just about incorporating reading, play um, into your days. The second is of course, our parent resource center Padlet that they created that we love that people are, I believe are continuing to add to. Um, it is categorized based on um, either need and, and or location. And you can scroll through all of these different resources that are here for you. Um, there are um, specific programs for children um, who have special needs and for our children that may not have special needs. Um, but you can see how it's broken up many of them into um, ages as well. So we hope you get to explore that. The third one has to do with um, programming through the Fairfax County um, government. And a lot of it was through our library and it's their summer library reading program. And uh, we thought you'd enjoy that because it has different, it has a calendar in here as well as to what they will be offering. And then the final one is the more specific link to the activities uh, and the calendar. And you can register right on um, this website based on what your interest is. And again, this is more for, we broke it down, you can see on the side for um, early literacy. But if you do have older children, you can link to um, the page that has activities for elementary age children or older. But the calendar is right here for you. Um, it gives a description and you can register to hold your place. This way you won't show up and they would say, oh, we're full. Um, you'll have a spot waiting for you. So we hope you take some time to explore those websites um, as a place for you to kind of take a deep breath to and enjoy that time with your child or enjoy having your child be with other children and maybe you can go and get yourself a coffee um, and practice some of that mindfulness that we have been talking about as well. So as we do come together, we, the, today was really, really uh, chock full of information and there was a, a lot of sharing on our end and we're very much looking forward to you sharing um, for the remainder of the time and asking questions. So as we have ended each of our sessions together, we would love to get a sense of where you are in describing how you are feeling about this, this information, this content. Do you feel like you still are just trying to understand everything that we've shared? Do you have a good understanding and you're really excited about implementing some, um, some new ideas? Or do you feel like you are ready to put so much of this into place um, that we really probably should have reached out to you to be part of our discussion because you've got such great ideas. So in the chat, please share with us um, where you are in your kind of learning process of how to work with your early learner as we approach the summer. Are you just beginning? Good understanding or I've got this. It's funny, there are times where I feel like I'm at the beginning and then there are times where I'm like, I've got this. And then I'm like, oh, maybe I don't. <laughs> I'm going to go and call my sister and say, how did you do this? And sometimes for me, it happens all within an hour. And it, all <laughs> like... Exactly. The good news is, is we feel so connected to all of you because not only are we in the field of education, but we are parents. And um, we're just so grateful for this opportunity to be on this journey with you. Um, and we hope to be able to, that we hope that you've, picked up some helpful tips and we are excited to always learn from you as well. 
So we see that there's lots of people feeling in various places, which is exactly probably where we should be, right? We fluctuate from, from one um, level of confidence to another. All right, so have um, completed our three-part series of our training together. And for those of you who have been to either one of our presentations, two or all three, again, we're just so grateful for your commitment um, to your children by carving out some time to be with us today and potentially some of those other days in March and April. And we really wish you the best of luck as summer approaches and take moments for yourself, take moments with your children to grow and, and have fun with opportunities. And we look forward to hopefully um, spending more time with you next year. Okay, would you like some questions? We yes. are Sounds good. happy for okay. questions. How do you help older children, 13 for example, to get unbored when they are on long-term restrictions from their electronic devices. <laughs> We've all come across this. <laughs> so choice, providing choice is never a bad option, regardless of an age. So, and it might be that you brainstorm with your child what those choices might be. All right, so this, and this, you are living my life. Um, so when, when we take that choice of electronics away, we provide other choices. Amy talked about this and Laura talked about this in those two structures um, that they mentioned earlier. So you, we, we know you want your electronics now. That's not an option. Let's talk about what is an option and brainstorm some things. Maybe just write it down. And then this way, this is actually, I had to do this with my own children. And then this way, when they have those bored moments and they say, I, I, there's nothing for me to do. You're taking away my only thing I want to do, which is play games online with my friends. Well, look, we brainstorm together some other things to do. What, which one of these options would you like to choose? Uh, to just build on that, another thing, and because I have, and have, this is a familiar question for, <laughs> for me as a parent also, is that um, when there's a lot of frustration about that, wouldn't be the time to have that moment in that discussion. It would be during a time, for example, a time when maybe there's a, a moment of connection that you have with your 13 year old that where things, it's more of a neutral space where the, their emotions are not as high with regard to the technology piece. And the reason is because with the brain science, we know that we're not really, when we feel emotions very, very intensely, we're not gonna really be accessing that prefrontal cortex work, great thinking and creativity and problem solving. The other thing um, that I wanted to offer is that um, I had to say to my 14 year old recently, my 14 year old son, I said, Joey, you know, I, I would love to spend more time with you. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to kind of get some ideas from you on that. And it truly meant it, right? So that uh, sort of the pause and the connecting and the listening and, uh, he loves being outside. He loves throwing Frisbee. He loves, sometimes we'll have good conversations in the car on the way to soccer. But for some of my kids, it's easier than others trying to get a sense of that. Mm -hmm. hope those, those are helpful. Now, Laura, I love that. And and a hundred percent agree that in the moment when, when we're escalated, those are not the times to have those planning conversations. We would have them maybe during dinner in, in what we would call kind of like a priming conversation. Hey, summer's coming. We're going to start, you know, the expectation is we want to start doing things other than seeing you in your room on your iPad. Let's brainstorm some things that we can do together and incorporate what Laura said. This is the perfect opportunity for us to spend more time together. Let's, let's write it down. Maybe you have a whiteboard or you have a, a journal and document it there. So then when those opportunities come where the electronics are not part of that option, you've already had that conversation previously. You already have your brainstorming idea. And maybe, you know, if they're stuck, you can offer some choice from, from that list. Hey, you know what? I think it's time to make some chocolate chip cookies. Let's go, let's do this together. And then, and then we can talk about what you might want to do next. So, um, I hope that helps, but we're, we're, we're there with you. We're, we're living the dream. 
with um, the electronics. One of the, <laughs> one of the questions was how to contact you all. And I think the best oh. thing would be for them to contact the PRC right here. Oh. And Shade has put everything in the chat. So if you have questions, contact us and we can help you um, through that. All right, let's go on to another one. Do any of the presenters have any printable templates they can share that they use with young children as visuals to help regulate behavior or explain a daytime or nighttime routine schedule? Yes, and we had, maybe we can share the um, resource page from our previous um, time together because it was embedded in that resource page. Would that be Easy. possible? Of course. I, I can I can attach all. Everything. Perfect. Okay. With younger children having screen time, can you give ideas? Oh, we just did that one on breaking boredom. Okay, so we did that one. How do you solve siblings' feelings of jealousy? I have a six-year-old who constantly feels frustrated about her baby brother. I tell her that I love them the same, but she doesn't understand. You're not alone. I'll, I'll start and then I'd love for, for Amy and Lori to jump in. Um, so what I've noticed over, over the years with six-year-olds who are feeling very understandable feelings is they sometimes appreciate um, kind of one-on-one -on -one time with a parent or parents and doing things that are kind of meaningful for them where they have that one-on-one -on -one attention, even if it's in small incremental time. So they get to experience, I'm in connection with you. And, you know, I have this, this is funny. Um, our kids were born pretty close together. And when I brought one of my kids home from the hospital uh, and, and then he got to be six months old, older sibling was two. And I put, um, I put Dominic in that extra saucer one day and, and Veronica looked at him and she was, she was about one and a half or two. And she said, I'd like you to take him out of there. I want to be in there. And I said, Oh, huh, you really want to be in there? She said, I'm too big. I said, no, that's true. Right. She's trying to process. She's trying to process. I'm not as young as you. There's things I, I, I'm trying to figure out what this relationship is. So there's, 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 there's changing and transition and those are hard feelings. So part of it is sometimes you really, you really don't like that, that you have a younger sibling. That's hard sometimes, but so we want to normalize the emotion and then also kind of build in some of the one-on-one uh, -on -one time, but I'd love Amy and Lori for you. Jen. Yeah. I think sometimes too, just with the normalizing or just kind of stating what it is. Yeah. I, it seems like I'm spending a lot more time with the baby because, you know, when he cries, he can't pick up his food. I have to help him with the bottle or, you know, he can't go to the bathroom. I have to help change, you know, so it, it seems like a lot of time. Um, and also ways to kind of incorporate, um, yes, there's times where they want to help out, like, you know, do you, do you want to pick which diaper or that kind of thing, or depending on how old they are, but then also, um, with the one-on-one -on -one time um, and then also the moments where you kind of get them to fall in love with each other a little bit. So it's like, oh yeah, he likes following the way you did it with those Legos or, um, oh yeah, you know, um, uh, or, you know, you, you help me understand what he said. Cause you know how sometimes siblings can understand each other and you're like, what, what, what was it? So like kind of those, those opportunities where it's like, you're also introducing what that unique relationship is for them as well. Okay. So what if I use the ACT approach, but the child never seems to follow through with the acceptable alter alternative that we discussed? Instead, the, the situation becomes unsafe, inappropriate, and out of control. The child later says that he cannot control himself and doesn't know how to do the right thing. This only happened at home, but is now starting to happen at school and sports. Any suggestions? So sometimes um, what I didn't mention too is uh, it could be like, it looks like you're having a hard time making a choice. I'm gonna, um, if you don't make a choice, then I can make a choice for you. And so if we're in that situation, we kind of can follow through with that choice. Or if it's really unsafe, we just sometimes have to remove the child from the situation, let it deescalate and then kind of talk about it further too. So. I'm appreciating how difficult that is. That's really overwhelming and hard. And I'm thinking because of the noticing of school and home mm -hmm. and soccer that connecting with, if you haven't already, the school team, we wanna really look at some, 
uh, supports that might make sense for the summer. Um, I'm just um, admiring that kind of things are feeling like some of these strategies are not where my child is and, and there might be some additional supports. And that takes that takes courage. And I, I, I just, I think that uh, connecting with the school team might be a really helpful, um, a helpful step there in terms of some resources, some additional resources. Um, and by school team, you're meaning FCPS? Yeah, I'm thinking the school social worker, the school psychologist, the school counselor. Yeah, I agree. And also contact us at the Parent Resource Center. Yes, we can help absolutely. you walk through. Uh, You're not alone. Options. Yeah, walk through some options yep. in FCPS, in the community, you know, uh, just yeah. those options. Mm -hmm. So ladies, I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. Amal has put our evaluation link in the chat. So I encourage everyone to please complete this evaluation. And I hope everybody has a wonderful Friday and a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.